Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good evening. Happy fall, and thank you so much for being here with us today. I hope you're all enjoying the beautiful day we're having in New York City. My name is Sophie Lowe, and I'm the Director of Visitor Services and Program Management at the Museum at Eldridge Street. While folks are joining us right now, uh, tell us where you're coming from and tell us about any connections you might have with us at Eldridge Street or the Forward. And for those of you who are new to us, the museum at Eldridge Street is housed in the Eldridge Street Synagogue, which is a national historic landmark uh, that has been meticulously restored over the course of 20 years. Opened in 1887, the synagogue is the first great house of worship built in America by Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. And today, it's the only remaining marker of the great wave of Jewish migration to the Lower East Side that is open to the broad public um, for anyone who wants to visit Jewish New York. I wanna thank everyone for joining us for today's discussion about the film, The Forward from Immigrants to Americans. Uh, we've been so proud to have on view at the museum at Eldridge Street, the exhibition pressed images from the Jewish Daily Forward. It's been on view since October, 2019. I uh, barely can remember that time, uh, but the show is finally coming to a close this Sunday, October 3rd. So please come by Eldridge Street if you still haven't seen it yet. We are open tomorrow on Friday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and then on Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. I also wanna thank The Forward and Hannah Pollock in particular for the dedication, scholarship, and joy they've shared with us uh, in this partnership um, in this exhibition. And of course, we also wanna thank Jody, Marlene, and Linda for being so kind uh, to be here with us today. And I will say that Marlene is actually joining us all the way from Hawaii. So that's some dedication right there. We feel very lucky to have her here. And I hope that most of you have already seen the film. We sent the link out to you last week. If you only recently signed up for our program tonight and have not yet watched it, don't worry. You have the link in your confirmation email from Eventbrite which you can find and the film will be available for you until Sunday. Please note this conversation is being recorded. We are offering closed captioning. Uh, it is powered by AI, which means you're going to see some typos throughout it, but thank you for your patience and understanding technology, I know. Uh, you can turn that feature on or off by clicking the closed captioning button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And of course, questions are encouraged. You can type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any comments, put them in the chat box and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the program. Now on to our speakers. So we have Marlene Booth. She is an award-winning documentary filmmaker um, who's bringing personal vision to stories that span generations locales, ethnicities, class, and gender. Her major films include The Forward from Immigrants to Americans, Yiddle in the Middle, Growing Up Jewish in Iowa, uh, Pigeon, The Voice of Hawaii, and many, many more. Her award-winning films have aired uh, on PBS, screened at national and international film festivals, and are used in classrooms nationwide. Linda Matchen is a journalist and documentary filmmaker specializing in issues relating to social justice and racism. She was a longtime writer and editor at the Boston Globe and now works independently as a writer for The Forward, Boston Globe Magazine, and The Washington Post. Her films include The Forward from Immigrants to Americans, Circus Without Borders, uh, which is about suicide among Inuit youth in Arctic Canada, and Lost Ancestors for the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, addressing the legacy of the slave trade. And Hannah Pollock, as I mentioned before, uh, she is the Forward's archivist and she provides research translations 
uh, and also provided um, a lot of the translations for the original forward archival content um, and has an eye for contemporary contexts. And she has been at the forward for, I believe, 21 years. So it's a really long time and I know they're really lucky to have her. And finally, our moderator today, Jody Rodoran. Uh, she's the editor in chief of the forward and has been since September 2019 after more than two decades as a reporter and editor at the New York Times. And it was at the Times that Jody served as Jeru Jerusalem bureau chief from 2012 through 2015, covering two Israeli elections and two wars in Gaza. She previously covered the 2004 American presidential campaign and served as Chicago Bureau Chief Education Correspondent and Education Editor and Deputy on both the Metropolitan and International Jet Desks before joining the masthead as Associate Managing Editor for Audience Strategy. Uh, really illustrious uh, career there. Jody was also the executive producer of the multimedia series One in Eight Million, which won the New York Times.com's first Emmy Award um, and in 2009. So Jody, unmute yourself and please take it away. Thank you so much, Sophie. It's so great to be in partnership with Eldridge Street. When my family and I, um, right after we moved back from Jerusalem a few, five years ago, uh, my kids and I went on a field trip with our Hebrew school to the museum. Um, I couldn't believe how much it, how beautifully it had been restored and how much had changed since I'd been there, you know, years before. And then right after I got to the forward, we did this great opening event uh, with the, with the Prest exhibit. So it's great to be back working with you again. Can you take the um, slide off so that we can, the, the speakers can get, yeah, there we go. See, now we get a little more, a little more FaceTime with my panel here. Um, and, and thank you all for joining us. I'm sorry I screwed up. I thought you could chat to everyone, but it's really quite incredible who we have with us. We have, I, so our panel is, we got Linda's in Newton, uh, Hannah is upstate in the Catskills, and Marlene, as, as Sophie said, is all the way in Honolulu. And we have people here from Newton, from Honolulu, but also from Denver, Colorado, from Montclair, New Jersey, which is where I am, from Montreal, from San Francisco, from Ohio. We've got members of the book club, Forward Book Club, Lexington, Massachusetts, I see. Um, and we've got at least so far two people who are related to people in this film, Shea Rarbach, the granddaughter of Leon Gottlieb, who was Ab Kahan's secretary and who also wrote serialized fiction for the forward and Robin Foyer Miller, whose father is in the film and who remembers when Linda and Marlene came to, uh, to interview him and who also said, She's a little apprehensive because she hasn't seen his, his face since he, he died. So it's really lovely to have you all with us. Thank you. And uh, Sophie said she's just enabled the chat so that you can um, chat to each other and to everyone. And we, I certainly will welcome people to comment and share their own reflections on the film or on the forward or on Eldridge Street in the chat as we go. Um, please do use the Q&A. Uh, not the chat, but the Q&A, if you have a question that you'd like me to pose to the panelists, and we'll, we'll definitely get to them and, and integrate them. You can start posting them right now or anytime you think of them. I want to start by asking Marlene and Linda to tell what Hannah, my colleague, called referred to as the birth story of this film. <laughs> Where'd you get the idea? How'd you get to work together? Why'd you do it? It was 1980 when the film came out, so I'm interested too in why then? Why now? Talk to us. Tell us the birth story. Uh, should I start, Marlene? Yeah, go ahead, because you came to me with this idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, at that time, I was working for the Boston Globe as a, free, as a, fiction, uh, a feature writer. And that was back in the days when we had a license to write about anything we wanted. And I had this notion that I wanted to write about... Um, the revival of Yiddish which sounds so quaint right now because it's, it's certainly been revived. But at that time, things were just starting to gear up again. The Yiddish Book Center was, was just getting off the ground and um, Yiddish groups were starting and the Yiddish language classes were starting to be offered. So I talked my editor into sending me to New York to check out what was the available, what, what I could see there. And one of the stops I made was to the forward, which I knew about having grown up in Winnipeg, Canada, 
because my grandfather saved every single edition of the forward and which completely filled up his one entire room of the house from floor to ceiling. And, and I didn't know what it was, but I knew it had to be important. And, um, you know, very briefly, I was just blown away by this interview because I, I'd never seen people use Yiddish as a working language before. And it really was, it was as if it wasn't in color, it was in black and white. It was so remarkable to me. Um, and I just kind of, I wrote the story, I filed it away. Um, but I, actually prior to this, about a week earlier, I'd gone to a party and met Marlene for the first time. And we were just chatting about what we did. She made films, I wrote articles and she said, hey, if you ever come up with an idea, let me know. So as soon as I got back, I it's called her. I found, I found it. <laughs> we, are, we are off the races. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, absolutely. So Marlene, when Linda came back to you and said, hey, remember me? I was at that party. Well, I have an idea. Right. What did you think? Well, I, I love the idea from the beginning. I had um, recently finished a film, which Tana was mentioning earlier, um, about a labor Zionist summer colony in New York State that my husband's grandparents had been a part of in the founding in the um, 1930s. And, uh, um, and that called Renana, this place. And that film had opened up in me a wish to know more about the world that they had come from, to not just assume that they were immigrants and that you were an immigrant and then you were American. I felt as though there was a piece of that in the middle that was very important that was missing. So when Linda came to me, I thought this could be a perfect place to tell that sort of history. Um, and it was around the time that Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers had come out, which sort of seemed to open up for popular readers um, the world of immigrants and, and to allow a discussion uh, to, to talk about that. So it seemed a perfect pairing, actually, that we could do the modern story of the four being there, but also nudge the history into it. And the timing is also pretty interesting because, um, I mean, you were kind of just in time to catch some of the original people. And yet also you had some people who were, um, who were definitely not, you know, who were, who were later, who were going, who are historians. So may, maybe tell us a little bit about the, the filmmaking process in terms of how you, I guess I, it's sort of a compound question. I'll start with a little bit of like, okay, so once you get the idea, what's your kind of, tagline on like what is this movie supposed to do and then tell us a little bit about how you went about like collecting interviews collecting archival footage putting together things um give us a little bit of the inside filmmaking 101 101 well part of the beginning of course with any film is raising money so that was one of the the early early issues how do we raise money how do we persuade people what do we write about to pull in funders who will be interested in this idea. And I think we began to work on that. And I know we got a $3,000 grant fairly early on, and I'm trying to remember what the source was. I don't really remember. Um, but we Linda used remembers. to be, we also, what? Do you remember, Linda? I think it was the Gifford Foundation. I mean, I'm just watching one of the members of the foundation is on this chat right now. Oh, <laughs> so thanks. Oh, for thank you. Right. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> the Kimbridge Foundation. Thank you from the Kimbridge Foundation. Um, and we decided to use it to, and, and there must have been, I can't quite remember what were the steps we took to um, nab an interview with Isaac Bashevi Singer who had fairly recently won the Nobel Prize for Literature. But it seemed to us that if we could get an interview with Singer, and this was already, this was 85, because Linda and I were both pregnant at the time, as a matter of fact. And I think that daughter may be on this webinar. Um, uh, we decided that we, we ended up, uh, Singer said yes. Singer said yes if we would pay him. Um, which is not usually done for a documentary film, but we decided that that interview was key to getting other people on board. Um, Leora, that's right. Thank you, Leora. <laughs> and um, so we did that. We went to Florida. Um, my uh, husband's great aunt had a place down there. We sort of got it cleaned up. We brought Singer along. 
um, to do the interview. Singer's wife, I don't know if you remember this, Linda, came along too, because Singer was a notorious uh, womanizer and she understood that the crew had two women in it and she wanted to be there to keep an eye on him. So that was the first interview, the interview with Isaac Pacheco so Singer. And he was very, very fortunate. That was so strategic and smart of you. And it is incredible to see him in the film. So he was living in Florida. That's why you were in Florida? Well, I should say. <laughs> in Florida in the winter. And he was on like West 86 or something. In, do you remember? In, you don't remember how much he wanted to be paid or how much you paid him, do you? I remember the circumstances. Um, which I'll tell that I forgot the amount. It's a thousand or three thousand or. I think we gave him the whole grant. I think we gave him the whole grant. Thank you, thank you, uh -huh. Gambridge. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was that was what he that was what he wanted. <laughs> As but, I recall, you know, it was worth it. That was that was a valuable interview. It was. Oh yeah. He, he mm -hmm. opened the door to let us into his apartment and outstretched his hand, and we put the money in it, and then he opened the door all the way. <laughs> No. I have to share, I have to, I, I have to share a little anecdote because it's so funny that you said about Ivy Singer being a womanizer. So earlier today, I did this interview with David Duchovny, the actor, writer, musician, that's going to be broadcast at our gala, but there was this part that's not going to be broadcast. So I'm going to share it with this smaller audience. So the reason we were interviewing David Duchovny is because his father was a Yiddish journalist and Khan, our amazing archivist, had uncovered <laughs> all of this history about his grandfather, sorry, I said his father, I meant his grandfather, Moshe Duchovny, um, that he didn't know. So it was this really incredibly emotional moment. But he started out before we said that, he said that David said that he once met Elie Wiesel um, and he went to hear a talk by Elie Wiesel and Elie Wiesel's son said, my father would like to meet you because he knew your grandfather. And Elie Wiesel said to him that his grandfather had, had a thing for actresses. That was the, that was, so I guess all these Yiddish writers are all just, wow. I mean, like they're just openly talking about it. Anyway, uh, we'll get back to the film and Khan, I'm going to bring you into this conversation mm -hmm. in, in just, a, just a second, but tell, tell us just a, give us one more beat on, on some of the process stuff. So get, landing the Ivy Singer interview, obviously so key. What were the other kind of key things that, that made this work or what were one of the, some of the harder things to get to nail? Well, um, you know, archival footage was important. And so that was, that was, uh, that, that took a lot of doing. Um, there is a, uh, I don't know if it's still there. There was a library of Yiddish film, of Jewish film at Brandeis when we were both in Boston. Yep. Yeah. So that was a terrific, I mean, the, the footage that's in the film of the shtetl is from the Brandeis collection. There were a lot of things from there that were uh, in the film. Um, Moses Rishon, who appears in the film, who was a, an expert on um, Abe Khan, said, you'll never find any footage of Khan, just doesn't exist. And we found a little teeny piece of footage of Abraham Khan that was at an archive, uh, the John E. Allen archive, somewhere in Northern New Jersey. I can't quite remember where it was. So those were, those were important pieces. Um, personally, I thought um, nabbing an interview with Pesach Novik, who is the, the main critic and who sort of ends the film, was also very important. Uh, he initially said he wouldn't be in the film. He said, it's not my place as a critic to be in a film about the forward. Um, but through friends of friends, we were able to persuade him that he should be in the film. Uh, he said he had, he had heard that um, that we were that we were saying that he uh, did not want to be in the film, and he said, "Who said that? She doesn't. She thinks I don't want to be in the film. I'll be in the film." <laughs> and got the interview right away. We struck while the, remember that the, the iron was. Yeah, yeah. Well, so those were those were some some of the moments. Linda, how long did you work on the film overall, and how much was the total budget in the end? Um, well, we spent from 1983 to 19, uh, 1983 to 89, six, six years. A lot of it was spent writing uh, and rewriting and rewriting grants for the National Endowment <laughs> for Humanities. So they started out, uh, they gave us a, um, a $20,000 grant to do research. And then um, we did some research and we 
put an advisory panel together and then we just hit the jackpot. They gave us $300,000, which was full funding for the film. So, so once we did that, we are, we are really off and running. Um, right. Yeah, Amazing. it was great. But I would say the ratio of fundraising to actual filmmaking is about, I don't know, 75% to 25%. That, that <laughs> seems to always be true, yeah. right? Yeah. Absolutely. So, Hannah, as, as yeah. Sophie said in the introduction, um, you've been working at the Forward as an as in the archives for 21 years, mm -hmm. and you're also an, an expert on on Yiddish and Jewish American archives elsewhere. So, you you come to this film in a totally different way than most of the rest of us. You know, most of us come being like, oh, we know a little bit about the forward. The, yeah, right, they taught people how to be American. But you know quite a lot about this history and you've read through a lot of the same archives that Linda and Marlene were combing through to, to make the film. So I just wonder what, when you when you watch this film and yeah. I watched it again recently, what's your kind of yeah. take? How do, you, how do you see it? Um, well, first of all, I was saying before in the green room, it's kind of like a super personal um, film for me too. I was telling uh, Marlene and Linda and Sophie that um, I first got to intern on it. I was uh, an undergrad at Hampshire and my, my job, I was working at the, as a student worker at the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Mass, which most of the people probably watching this know is like the Yiddish sort of ground zero epicenter. Uh, book repository and cultural activities and saving Yiddish and reviving it and stuff. Anyways, and uh, my job ended up being like, um, I was telling Marlene, um, transcribing interviews. So I was, those voices were like in my ear and it just like that started me on my way. Like I knew I was interested in Yiddish. I was definitely interested in film and photography, but that, that process of transcribing and those voices in my ear, you know, was just like, started me on my path. And um, so it's kind of personal, like when I actually saw the film for the first time and saw the voices with the, you know, the actual bodies attached to them and the individuals, it was, uh, it was like, um, like an out of body experience. I always have kind of when I watch the film. So that said now flash forward, you know, decades later, <laughs> it is also like the reason I really wanted to see it again with this company and to, to bring it to a new generation, I think of um, Yiddish lovers and forward readers and Eldridge goers and just, you know, people everywhere. It's, it's not just for Jews is it's a time capsule of a very particular moment in American history and Jewish history in New York City history. And, you know, obviously in my own personal history too. And um, like you said, really poignantly, those folks are not, right? Like they hit the sweet spot when you could walk down the street in New York. And first of all, there were newsstands. Like, <laughs> and there was like, I don't know if you, I think I saw in some of the shots, there was a variety. There was a little, you know, you could pick the fry height, right? Novix paper, you Absolutely. could speak before, yeah. right? There, there were like some choices and now we're, we're sort of the, the last house on the block for Yiddish journalism, for sure. And uh, so, so that I find also very, very beautiful about New York City. It, it just speaks volumes as a time capsule. And it itself sort of, now I was thinking as I was watching it this afternoon, I was like, this has to be like redone as like a meta, like each individual who is speaking in this film, it should be a hyperlink because they are like Moses Rishon, tremendous oh. individual in right in understanding Abkhan, understanding our history, understanding this American Jewish particular experience, the Lower East Side, right? That whole thing. And and Leon Stein, like I, I have like heroes in the movie, like I'm in love with Leon Stein, right? Like, and he he ends up like on my journey, I find out, well, guess who translated our founding editor Abkhan wrote like a five volume uh, biography and Stein translated that biography. Yeah. So like there are all these other ways and, and I mean, this is like really, really meta for me, <laughs> but um, the awestruck couple who's interviewed, right? The, he's, he's listed as like a plumber, like him and his wife. He, if I remember correctly, was one of the first people to help Aaron Lansky, the founder of the Yiddish Book Center, when Lansky was a young student and said, I have this vision, this is what I wanna do. I wanna save Yiddish literature. I wanna go out and collect Yiddish books. Ostrov was on it like right away. Right, this is like a retired gentleman, worked hard all his life, was an activist, was on the streets, right? He tells these really poignant stories and he never let go. He just, he really helped. Like if there is a Yiddish revival, the Ostrovs are, um, you know, a big, big Incredible. reason. 
and they were our readers. That that's our readership. Like if we yeah. are here today having this conversation, it's because of people like Ostroff and Marlene and Linda got it. They totally got it. The I think. Well, I think told us about Ostroff. And the thing about and this is so um, sort of representative of so many people. Ostroff wasn't just. Uh, they all used just their last names. He wasn't just a plumber. He was an artist, and he right. used things like plumbing fittings and pipes to make just extraordinary. I mean, he just like anticipated the whole art naive movement, you know? And I, I remember oh, his house was full of these gorgeous works of art made out of plumbing and spoons. And, yeah, and I, he gave me, I mean, one of the yeah. things I cherished the most was this, a spoon that was made out of, well, the silver. And then he put bronze inside it with stars of David and, um, I high in it. It was gorgeous. I have it hanging on my in my kitchen, and it's um, you know it's kind of full of holes because of the Star of David and so on. And he gave it to me and said, "Mit this spoon, you'll never get fat." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, great. are always so much more than what their working class profession was, right? I mean, that's you know, I th I think it's his wife who says in the film this amazing line. I, it, about you know how it started so we each gave one day's pay to start the forward right and i'm thinking this is you know we're now a reader supported nonprofit. Right, like if we right. could just get everyone to give us we don't need a whole day's pay you know 18 dollars right. whatever <laughs> and the idea that people would get together and like yeah we need that we need this paper we're going to start this paper and everyone's going to give one day's pay it's kind of like it's mind-boggling yeah, yeah. To imagine how that works Originally, originally, they passed the hat. Yeah, they passed the hat. That's what they did. And if you, um, I was thinking about too when when I heard that uh, spoken in the movie that in the seventies and eighties, the the Fords had two like pretty big crises where you know that's what you're coming into this movie too. They're just kind of coming out of that last big fiscal crisis, right? Uh, Weber right. tells us right. we're going yeah. we're going to a weekly. We can't be. A, this is like a huge huge moment for them, right? They still have the radio station, but it's not. And, and people literally sent in dollars. That's what saved the, I mean, I'm not, it's not the only thing that saved the forward, but that is a lot of what saved the forward. And that came from that same idea that grassroots, that it's up to us, it's up to us. We love the forward. We, the readership, love the forward. We, the readership are gonna just do whatever we can. And very poignantly, the forward in the 70s and 80s, when they did these fundraising type, very grassroots campaign, they would republish those, like people literally said, yeah. this is what I have, I have to, and the mm -hmm. forward published those letters, you know? So, so that mm -hmm. is like- I mean, DIY. there are so many ways in which it was the people's paper, the recipes, the personal ads, those letters, the bintel, of course, the, the way it was a bulletin board for the, the uh, missing husbands as they showed right. in the film. So, and that, that idea of we are our community and you, you readers, you, you kind of can own the paper. I mean, there was on the one hand, the vaunted writers, right? And then also those, those bulletins, you've showed me so many pages of the people sending their bar mitzvah photos, their wedding photos, et cetera, but very much was a, a community uh, paper, even though the community was so uh, natural and international in its way. I wanna ask a couple questions that really are, are not of, of either the time you're making the film or the time the film's about, but really looking from the contemporary lens. And the first is, I mean, here we are four women talking about this film in which I think one woman appears in the entire thing. Uh, um, and this was an awfully male uh, operation. And I guess I'm interested in your thoughts about, it's interesting because from the beginning, there was this whole idea of like the women are reading it. We're going to talk about hats. We're going to talk about, there's, a, there's always a robust food section aimed at women, but um, it, it sure was a very male dominated uh, sense. So I'm wondering both maybe People, if you can talk a little bit about how that looks to you now, but also how it was to be young women making a film with about all of these men. Um, well, we were. Well, it wasn't just the two of us. We, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we were all feeling it. So the camera person was a woman. The sound person was a woman. So we are all women. I have to be honest. I it wasn't until last night when I watched the film again yeah. for the first time in so many years that I, it really hit me over the head that there were no women, hardly any women except Fanny, who actually held <laughs> the whole place together. Right. Um, and I, um, yeah, it, I don't know what, what to say about that. It, it breaks my heart, it makes me angry. 
I just don't know if there would have been a place for them. Yeah. But I, I mean, of course, there was a place for them, but whether they would have they they would would have been let in. I don't know. What do you think? I Arlie? think there may have been some women writers, um, but they were not people who were the main writers in residence there. I think there were bylines from. In fact, there was a Masha someone who wrote about film. I can't think of her last name. Masha, Leon. Masha somebody. Do you know? Masha Leon. Yeah, that's it. Masha Leon. That's it. That's right. So she wrote for them, and I think maybe she came into the office at some point. Um, I don't know very much about her. Uh, do you? <laughs> uh, yeah. When she was there, we met her. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like, in the history, well, first of all, just to flash back a second to the film, there's this great shot of Ab Khan as like a super tight when he's really, really young, and he's standing very, very quickly. He's standing next to a gentleman with a mustache. That's Michal Zemetkin, one of his co-founders, co-conspirators, helped get the forward started. And Zemetkin's wife was like in the, the first picture of the first printers of the first edition of the forward, April 22nd, 1897. That one group photo, there's one woman and that's Zemetkin. Uh -huh. And um, she ended up being like a tremendous social scientist um, of her time. Uh -huh. And s some would say she helped, uh, starting in like the late teens, we did end up, they were experimenting as women got suffrage. Khan was also, oh, we better have a women's page. I'm not saying it's anything to do with the generosity of his heart. I don't think he was a feminist necessarily, but he was a progressive and they wanted women to be mm -hmm. active in politics. That's their motivation. That's what they were mm -hmm. going for. So um, Zemeckin, I think was charged with getting that page together and she, she, she wrote for it occasionally. And then she did actually have um, at least one published book of her own. That said, the forward did publish Yiddish women writers. And that whole mm -hmm. process right. of, of sort of unearthing is much easier now that we're in digital technology and not the early 1980s. But the early 1980s with the Yiddish revival, there are tremendous efforts being made. Paula Hyman is in this film, right? She, oh, she's right. like a, a huge um, a Jewish feminist historian who had a lot to do with unearthing uh, Yiddish women, right? So uh, Irina Klefis, she's not in the film, but at that time, I believe in the 80s, she was... Uh, director at Evo. She, she's a huge, huge um, person for, for many of us. If you wanted, you know, she, her and Melanie K. Kantrowitz, when I was an undergrad in the 80s, they came to something by the Yiddish Book Center. They called together a group of women in Northampton and the, the Western Mass area. They said, if you're interested in Yiddish women's writer writing, we have to do the work. Just, just like the forwards readers, like we had to do the work. So, so that started around the time that this, this film came out. So it, it's a process, you know, and, and a lot more is, is known today. And we do write about that in the foreword today. So, um, yeah, I want to say, um, I'll, I'll find the, Hannah or I will put the link in the chat, but for just a couple of months ago, Hannah did a deep dive looking for kind of LBGTQ and, and uh, queer and trans history in the foreword um, and had a really interesting kind of journey of, what we found, what we didn't find, and what that whole process was like, and wrote a beautiful essay about it um, that we will share. Um, I wanna also say that I asked that question on my own, but then looked at the Q&A to find that Carol Russoff, one of our members of our audience, basically asked the exact same question. So thank you, Carol, for that question and, and keep your questions coming in the Q&A. We're gonna to get to them in just a minute. My other like contemporary lens question really jumps off something you said in the beginning, Marlene, which is about, you know, this is this is a, obviously a Jewish story, a Yiddish story, a story of the Lower East Side and a story of the forward, but really it's fundamentally a story about immigration. And, and here yeah. we are now in 2021, um, having so many new uh, debates and discussions about immigration. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we were, we were talking about it's just, it's also the 50th anniversary of Fiddler uh, this year. And so we were brainstorming different coverage. And I was, I, we were talking the other day about how do, you know, Syrian refugees feel about Fiddler or, you know, what's, how does the refugee story kind of connect that? But I wonder what your thoughts are about what this story of our history in the first half of the century, the history of the foreword of, of Jewish immigration, whatever, kind of has to say about contemporary immigration or what, I, I don't know, just kind of how, how, how should we yeah. think about um, 
back those contemporary issues with this, with all this history in mind. Right, right. Well, I mean, it seems to me that one of the things that the forward did was um, to give dignity to immigrants and to give dignity to workers. Bob um, Shulkin talks about that in the film. But in fact, the, the lives of immigrants was given real seriousness by the forward. And, and the forward seemed to understand, the writers seemed to understand the step-by-step -step process that was necessary to, that, that one didn't just become an American overnight. And there were in fact columns in the paper, I mean, Han was talking about addressing women that talked about what, what you should put in your child's school lunch so that the teachers would not think ill of them. You should not pack a whole onion in your child's lunch. Um, and uh, uh, I, so I think, I mean, I don't know if there are um, foreign language newspapers, in fact, that play the role that the forward played in the lives now of current immigrants. I don't know about that. Um, but I think they, they understood that the, I mean, they themselves had been immigrants, the writers. They knew this process intimately and they valued it, they valued it and they understood how difficult it was. Um, and they didn't mean, they didn't in any way diminish the lives of immigrants. Actually, so, Marlene, you bring up something that I've always kind of wondered and maybe Hannah knows, or maybe you know, but it's like, right, there's all these times where in Bintel and in other ways, the, the editors are, are really directly like teaching people how to be American. Gra there was a, there was a step-by-step -step how to vote. There was this whole essay about should you let your kids play baseball? And as you say, the school lunch, but yeah, they yeah. were all immigrants themselves. It's kind of interesting. Like yeah, teaching, yeah. I mean, each one teach one, I guess, but really right. You know, you don't have to be here very long before you're suddenly the expert on how it all works, I guess. Right, 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 right. right. And also sort of describing it within, within the context that they understood. I think there was a sort of um, like a Parshat Hashav, I mean, a, a, a like the Bible reading of the week, right? And they use that as a um, as a context for telling these stories. Hmm. So they understood what the yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, I, I just I was just thinking about this sort of irony or a paradox or something in the film. I mean, here on the one hand, it's a newspaper devoted to helping people become Americans. On the other hand, a couple of people in the film use the word assimilate like a, like it was a, a curse word, you know? Oh, he was an assimilationist, yeah, like that's a bad thing. And yeah. so what, is that, yeah. what does that say? It's okay to be American, but don't lose your culture or don't forget who you are. As opposed to now, when it's be an American, but don't even think of, you know, wearing your head covering or, um, you know, there was a sense of, of both being able to embrace the Americanism and embrace your history at the same time. And that doesn't seem to be the case anymore mm -hmm. in the way. I suppose too, for all the like learn to be American, it was also a socialist paper in a capitalist society and you know, paper that was very, was an outsider in a lot of ways. No, Fana, was that a raised eyebrow saying, no, that that's wrong? Uh, no, um, I guess I'm thinking of, um, like um, by by the, by the time we're we're watching this film, right in the eighties, that's also what's so moving to me about that. It is just what we were saying. Like American Jews are moving out of that, right? We're not really. I mean, like we're back in the Lower East Side because it's trendy, okay, basically, and not we're not stuck. We have choices. We have choices. We're moving uptown. We're moving to the suburbs. Not to say that there doesn't remain Jewish working classes, but also industry is changing in America and unions are about to change drastically in America and like the forward changes, right? And the readership changes. So it's it's a very, but, but and, and also along with the, sorry, along with the Yiddish revival, you know, quote unquote, is also a Jewish identity and identity politics and gender politics and race, like bringing us all the way to this moment right here now talking about this film, right, in this context, in this bigger context. And those immigrants gave us or gave, gave me, right, and this paper gives me a real leg to stand on in terms of my identity as a secular Jew, right? That it is about, um, uh, you know, what the Workman Circles motto 
that the forward supported was a shenere and besere welt, a more kind, more just, beautiful world. That's, let's say, that's that's our thrust even today, right? That's what we're going for. So, you know, it's not the same. It can't remain the same, right? But that that was just like a very mm -hmm. special, special um, sort of turning point that they they capture that's captured in the film, and that we still resonate with. We still argue around, and we're still trying to figure out today in the paper, on the website, I should say. <laughs> the paper in quotes. It's okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna we so uh, we do have. A, I want to encourage people to put questions if you have them um into the q a i just we do have a comment or sort of question from shea rarbach the gr granddaughter of leon gottlieb who says that she has met two research she thought that leon answered the letters to bintel um and and she knows that gottlieb was not quite ib singer but that he he was a writer too and we, i just got a question on the, the prior event i was doing with the host of our new bintel brief podcast and i hope you'll all uh, listen to our Bintel Brief podcast. Hana is a frequent guest there, um, guest star. But someone just asked a question: Do they ever make up letters? There was, there's always a sense that Abgahan made up letters. So what do we know about whether Abgahan made up letters? Whether Leon Gottlieb or someone else answered them? What do we know about the true backstory of the Bintel Brief? Yeah. I feel, you know, it's, this is what's so cool about this paper and this film and this, this sort of movement, right? Like, I feel like I don't want to think Ab Khan out. Like, I still feel that tight with him and with what he put out, right? I don't want to, I don't want to tell him. But, but um, a lot of things would suggest, I'm sure we're not the only advice column that, um, first of all, everybody took a turn is what I have always heard. And um, let's see the evidence that the last person responding was a writer called Isaac Metzger. He's the person who's, who authored the translations that were then yeah. published. So if you've read them in English, it's because of Isaac Metzger. Isaac Metzger um, was a Yiddish writer. He wrote several novels. He was very much beloved and respected. And so it was his turn. It was his post that the, you know, they, they ended it in the mid to late eighties, the Bindle, the original Bindle. So, Along the way, some stories have come out. For example, um, Mendel Osharovitz, who is uh, one of our really, really strong, I would say like political affairs correspondents. Um, he also is known to have authored it. And one of the ways we know is there's a Yiddish film called The Breva Leder Mamen, A Letter to Mother, mm -hmm. that he authored a lot of the script or he wrote the, the screenplay. He had a lot to do with it. And there are scenes outside the forward office, in the forward office, in that film. And they all have to do really with like, the real story of, of Bintel Brief is that so many of those letters were about family repatriation. And the story of that film, of Riva Leder Mamen, is about a mother who loses contact with her child during the war and her immigration to America. And the whole mm -hmm. film is just like very mm -hmm. melodramatic, mm -hmm. but, but based on, let's say, the material that made up the Bintel Brief. Um, the film Hester Street that is based on Ab Kahan's novel, uh, Yekel, is also said to have, um, you know, he got his material from, from reading the Bintel Brief. And Abkhan himself said about the Bintel Brief that he started the Bintel Brief because, I mean, first of all, the forward building was open 24 seven. So people mm. came to that building 24 seven. And in mm. the very, very beginning years, they came with their Bintels that weren't written out. They just came personally with the issues, with their problems, right? And so he was mm. like, well, real life mm. is, you know, better than any novel you can read, something like that. So from that, I would yeah. gather that, you know, everyone kind of took a turn. So a couple more questions. I, I, to, actually, a really interesting question would be whether there were women that answered Bento letters. Because um, we think of advice columns today as so often authored by women. Um, I don't know. I mean, you could probably yeah. do some really cool textual analysis of whether any of the, the ah, answers seem totally. to be written by women. There is, there's a famous, uh, a biography just came out of this one, uh, Lower East Side a socialist activist woman, some of you may have heard of, Rose Pastor. She finally got a, mm -hmm. a biography and she was uh, brought specifically by Ab Khan to work the Bintel Brief for a little while. Mm. I, I first of all want to apologize that I realize it's getting dark behind me. I, I was flooded out of my basement office and I now work on this 
enclosed porch. And anyway, it's almost seven o'clock. So, um, but I'm just gonna, I, I don't really have an easy way to fix it. So bear with me. Um, a couple things from, from the Q and A. So Anita Diamond is asking, um, how many people subscribe to the forward online, any hope for forward 2.0. And she says she's hungry to read and see the next chapters of the story. So we are deep in inventing for, Forward 2.0 or maybe Forward 3.0, if you count the original English as 2.0 uh, right now. And uh, we've been fully digital since the early part of 2019, still publishing in Yiddish every day, mostly in English. Um, you can uh, subscribe to our newsletters for free at uh, forward.com slash newsletters. And we do have about 15,000 paying digital subscribers and a number of other, many thousands of other actual individual and foundations that support us with donations. Um, and as I said, we are about to have our virtual gala on October 20th, which is the most important fundraiser of our year. But the, those, the more important numbers about than how many people subscribe to the Forward Online really is how many people read the Forward. And we reach about 1.5 million people every month wow. um, across yeah. platforms. We have a new video series called Yiddish Word of the Day starring our Yiddish editor, Rachel Schachter, that has had something like 700,000 views over the last year. Um, and so there are lots of ways to connect with us on, our, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Zoom events. And again, through our, our newsletters. So Anita, I am eager and hungry for you to see the next chapters of the story that we are really trying very hard to write right now with a great um, team of journalists and other folks at The Forward trying to make sure that this legacy carries forward to that next generation. Um, Barbara Askinas, I think I'm pronouncing that right, wants to know, I think Hana, when did The Forward start to list personal ads? She says her great grandfather placed an ad to marry off his youngest of 12, and that was her grandma, <laughs> Faye. Wow, such a great question. Um, you should just email me at the forward and we'll try to crack the case. But um, I think they always had some type of classified, but it really hit its peak in like the 20s and 30s, and then it sort of tapered off. So, hmm, yeah. It's a great question. Do you know how long, actually, it's very funny because last year in the middle of the pandemic, um, someone went into the office and uh, sent us, sent, sent letters back to us or whatever. And I got this thing, uh, it was a handwritten letter with a $20 bill. Somebody wanted to place a personal ad for their daughter. And we were like, uh, we don't really do that anymore. But do you have a sense of when it stopped? Like how long they did it for? Um, well, I guess I'm merging personals and classifieds because personals, of course, you know, had an upswing, right? Almost around when this film is being made, they're sort of coming into vogue again, right? People are meeting through the classifieds, like for that last round before the internet dating thing kind of takes over. So all through the 80s, we ran personal ads. And I, I would venture a guess that by the time this film is being, you know, by, by the 90s, there's, there's not really any more personal ads to speak of in the forward, but always, always in the Yiddish forward, if you wanted to place a personal ad, nobody was gonna stop you. But there just wasn't like a whole, you know. Um, so uh, someone, uh, Leora Fishman is asking in the chat, something that was gonna be my closing question. Uh, what are Merlene and Linda doing now? <laughs> Go ahead, Linda, you take it first. <laughs> Leora is the Gimbridge person and a friend of mine. So, okay. <laughs> hi, Leora. Um, so, I left the Boston Globe in 2018, and I've sort of gone up my own as a journalist since then. Um, <laughs> it was funny when I was um, watching the film last night uh, at the big event. Simon Weber said, retirement is niche for a survivor. <laughs> uh, retirement's not for a writer. And uh, it's not, you know, I'm just um, bubbling along writing for The Forward, which has been fantastic. And the Washington Post arts section and for the Boston Globe magazine and working on- well, Tell new... about your most latest assignment, Linda. What's that? So tell us about your current gig at The Globe. Uh, at the Globe, I'm working on a magazine piece. Oh, it's not a very pleasant subject, um, but I'm I'm profiling the state troopers who um, who are the folks who combat child pornography. So they just do the hideous work 
of sitting in front of the screen all day. I meant, I meant the happier thing you're doing or the more inspiring thing you're doing being Globe Santa. <laughs> oh, you, <laughs> um, so the, the Globe. All right, did you not want to talk about that? The Globe is a charity that's been fantastic for, oh gosh, 70 years or so called Globe Santa. And um, it's actually ecumenical, but what they do is they raise money uh, starting in October to give toys to children in need of all backgrounds. So Santa is kind of the public face of it, but even Jewish children get toys and immigrant children and refugee children get toys. And I'm the, I'm the new Globe Santa editor, which means I there's <laughs> very small letters that come in from people who are um, in serious need and um, try to find, write stories about them or assign stories about them sort of every day leading up to Christmas. I remember reading it growing up and we uh, gave toys to those we got, we did that program. So if, I was thrilled that you were doing it. Marlene, what are you up to these days? So, um, so as I may have mentioned earlier, 18 years ago, uh, my husband and I moved to Honolulu from Boston. And uh, uh, for several years, I taught film at the University of Hawaii. And I've made a couple of films about Hawaii and Hawaii subjects since I've been here. Um, I retired, one, one about, in fact, I, I've got to say it was inspired by Yiddish, one called Pigeon, the Voice of Hawaii, about a language that's spoken here by most of the people that is an essentially Hawaii's Yiddish. Um, so, um, so that's one of them. Um, cool. And I retired from teaching a couple of years ago, and um, I'm working on another film, a more personal film, and a shorter film. And uh, about uh, almost 18 months ago, I became a Bubby. So that's my most recent Yiddish incarnation oh, and one that I love oh, very much. Tov. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Hana is doing many things, including making stories for an app called Urban Archive um, from the Ford's collection. And uh, we are going to be soon launching a column called Ask the Archivist, in which she will track down different things from our archives. Um, and we are also trying to move forward with projects to get our archives uh, digitized to make them more accessible, uh, both for her work and for everybody else. Um, so those are some of the things that's going on with the forward and the archives. We have another question from Harold Perlmutter. Did the forward have any ties to WEVD radio? Did the forward ever, Hana, why don't you take that one? Uh, right, uh, that was our radio station named for Eugene V. Debs. And uh, the motto was, it's the station that speaks your language, meaning that most of the programming was in Yiddish. And um, about two decades ago, um, the, uh, the Yiddish world's amazing sound archivist, klezmer revivalist, um, all around amazing historian Henry Sapoznik got together with David Esai and they put together an incredible uh, program for NPR called um, the Yiddish Radio Project. And you can hear a lot of WEVD uh, recordings there if, if you're, you're interested in that. And I just wanted to um, give a shout out for a second because I see in the chat, uh, Lillian Silver, the, the, the editor that's in this film, uh, Simon Weber, uh, who Marlene and, and uh, Linda got to interview for the film. Um, his daughter, Lillian um, Weber Silver, is actually with us in the audience. And um, she writes that she grew up in Rochester. Her father was Simon Weber, and she grew up with the forward with Isaac Besheva Singer, with Ellie Wiesel, and all the others who wrote for the forward. And I can uh, testify to some amazing anecdotes that uh, Lillian has. Um, both about her dad and about growing up as being part of the, you know, what we call the forwards mishpocha, right? Like if your, mm -hmm. your dad was a, and I also wanted to, I forgot to say, Jody, we forgot to say, um, one of the individuals who's interviewed in the film is um, the uh, prominent late, um, you know, codifier of, of Yiddish, um, uh, Mordecha, Professor Mordecha Schechter, and it's his daughter who is now the Yiddish um, editor of the forwards. So that is kind of a nice It word. is a big mishpacha. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are close to seven o'clock. So I thank you everybody for being here. It's been an incredibly uh, fun and, and, and enlightening discussion for me. And I think for our audience, it's great to hear you all 
uh, see all of your chats as well. I'm going to give each of you a, a chance to just add a couple of thoughts, final thoughts about the, you know, as, as you've gone back to the film, it's been such a cool occasion to bring you all back to the film. Um, and through this discussion, just any, any kind of last thoughts, last words, anything you want to add? Uh, Linda, why don't you go first? Well, the, re the, the journalist, the newspaper reporter in me um, is very heartened and sort of inspired by the, the love and dedication of the four writers. And I know that newspapers are steadily being whittled away, but I think this newspaper, this film really shows how newspapers can tie a community together and mm -hmm. build, build a among people who don't know each other and um, teach so much and help people find something to rally around and identify with. And, um, you know, it's my hope that they'll just keep going very, very strong. Um, in this film, there was a fear that the forward would disappear and it didn't. And um, I hope the same for English language newspapers. Uh, Marlene? Um, well, I would say ditto to all that Linda said, except for the fact that I'm not a journalist, but um, you know, it was remarkable to re-enter the world of the forward 33 years ago. Um, that world is pretty much gone, but it was a world that had such um, integrity and, uh, and such a sense of purpose about who its readers were and who it, and it knew who it was too, that newspaper. And so being a part of it again, that whatever it was that we used to feel when we went to the forward offices to film came back, just this sense of, of connection and um, uh, connection to each other and connection to a larger purpose. Um, so um, you never know when you make a film that it will become a historically important film. Um, so that's a, that's a good lesson to learn that what we do today will be history in two years. So true. Oh, thank you. Hannah? Thank you, Hannah. Thank you and Sophie for bringing this so, together. Thank Hannah, you. Last thought. Oh, last thoughts. Um, I guess, um, I would, uh, you know, um, in the, the classic book about Yiddish film by Jim Hoberman, Bridge of Light. You know, and his final chapter when he's, you know, well, there's no more Yiddish film, but there's a couple of avant-gardists or blah, blah, blah. He says, um, he takes th those latest experiments in making Yiddish films new again. He takes those and he places them on the grave of Yiddish cinema, like we do when we go to a Jewish cemetery, right? So yeah. I would say that this film for me is like the opposite of that. It's like, it's, it's just a key. If you are interested in Yiddish, if you're watching this, if you're even the least bit curious, hook into our paper, take a look at this film and, and they just keep going, they keep going. So um, I thank you so much for having faith in the 1980s that this was you know, something to look at and to pay attention to. Yeah, um, so I'll just, so first of all, someone, Elaine Leibowitz just asked in the chat, will there be a virtual tour of the, of the pressed exhibit? So Sophie or Hannah, you wanna just answer that one quickly? So there we was. have been talking about uh, making some of the, the objects available virtually, uh, but you can come and catch the exhibition if you're local. Uh, it is on view until this Sunday. So you have two more days to check us out. Um, but we do have some videos that are online. Um, I believe there is a, a virtual tour from past Yep. Uh, that you can access and, and we can we can give everyone um, the link and, to that. And you know what else, Sophie? I forgot. Um, we're doing this exciting project with Press and Eldridge and Urban Archive in the forward where we're uploading a lot of the images from the show onto um, uh, this uh, web, web and uh, it's also an app based app that's a digital mapping of all the stories that were impressed and it's sort of ongoing and you can you can find it now if you go onto urban archive and look up pressed and that'll give you a sense of the show. And Ruth is asking the great question we love. Yes, we do need funding to make a virtual tour. Uh, to, we could absolutely use that. But also I wanna say, I know we have a lot of people from a lot of communities here. We are also looking for places to host the exhibit uh, next year. Um, we would be eager to be in any cities. Um, we're definitely looking so, so be in touch 
uh, about that, that would be fantastic. I will also offer my uh, last thought, which I, I told the panelists before we started, which is just, I was really, um, you know, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a thing to be the editor of a 125 almost year old um, institution with uh, such a legendary uh, founding editor in Ab Kahan. Um, his desk, his old historic desk is in the office where I used to work and I'm going to work again soon. Um, and it's quite a thing to, to be in that legacy and in that tradition, it's quite an honor and it's quite a burden. And I was so moved uh, to see more about him in the film and, and it, particularly this one um, line, which I shared with you, one of the, one of the, um, one of the analysts in the film said that he, he used to use, he was criticized sometimes for using the plain kind of Yiddish a Yiddish and that he would say that the paper had to, had to be written the way people talk, had to be in the language that people speak, not in some formal detached language. And as Hana knows and everyone on my team knows, I say that almost every day that um, that we should write in the way people talk, and so I feel uh, affirmed by that. And it's really great to know that. I mean, so much of the film is like, whoa, the you know the typesetting and things that are so different, and yet the fundamental thing is the same, which is that a journalism organization, a newspaper, a news organization is about informing and connecting and writing the way people talk. So thank you for that. Thank you for the film. Thank you for being with us tonight. And thank you, Sophie, for hosting us. And thank you to all of our audience. And it's not too early to say Shabbat Shalom. So yeah. I'll end with that. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, thank you thank all you. so much again to our panelists, to everyone, to our audience. I wanna echo that. Um, I also wanna, to, uh, give a quick plug to our upcoming new exhibition that is opening uh, in just a couple of weeks on October 14th. Um, we're gonna be looking at these really interesting questions like what medicines and precautions and other means are employed in order to have clever children? Uh, these different traditional beliefs of different generations of um, Eastern European Jews. And this artist, Deborah Olin, uh, she's going to be bringing nine uh, mixed media works and installations that are inspired by a survey developed just before World War I by an ethnographer named Ansky. So it should be pretty interesting. And we'll see a kind of uh, uh, stories about the ways of life in the Pale of Settlement. So um, wonderful. Anyways, thanks to all of you. And I look forward to seeing you back at Eldridge Street very, very soon, hopefully with some articles in hand from the forward. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.